This is CBC Here and Now. I can't tell you, you know, the fear I have for these people. I really, I, I hope they are okay. Everybody is looking, looking hard for, you know, a uh, happy ending. Bound for a deep sea dive to the Titanic, the search continues tonight for a missing sub and its crew. St. John's International Airport wants to bring transatlantic flights back to the city, but it wants the provincial government's help to do it. I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. A submersible vessel that takes tourists and researchers to the Titanic wreckage is missing in the Atlantic Ocean. Ocean Gate Expeditions, the company which runs the tour out of St. John, says they've lost communication with the sub. Here and Now's Heather Gillis is standing by live with the latest. So Heather, what more can you tell us? Well, Carolyn, what we know right now is that the U.S. Coast Guard out of Boston is leading the search and rescue mission. The Canadian Coast Guard is also involved. They had a ship offshore and sent that to aid in the search, and the Canadian Forces has also sent an airplane to help in that search. Now, it's believed that the crew left here St. John's Harbour on Friday and that the sub was reported uh, missing on Sunday evening overdue by just a couple of hours, but so far no contact with that submarine, according to the company. Now, we've spoken with Misel Joe, who is the head of the Miyapakek First Nation Band, and they actually own a ship called the Polar Prince, and that towed the sub out to the Titanic wreckage site. And the Marine Institute also says that it had a student working with the company, with Ocean Gate. They say uh, in a statement that the student is on board the Polar Prince and that they are accounted for, which of course is some um, good news. For sure, Heather. Um, what have we heard from the company itself on this? Well, not much. They released a statement around lunchtime today, but it only had four bullet points. And in that statement, the company said that and confirmed that they lost contact with the sub, with the semi-submersible. And they're thanking all of the people who are involved in the search and who are helping the company try to, what they say, re-establish contact. Now they say they are mobilizing all options to bring their crew back safely and their entire focus is on the crew and their families. And we, we've been following along since Ocean Gate started offering these tours. Uh, CBC News was there when the head of the company gave a tour of the sub last year. So we're going to have a look at that video. And Heather, can you also tell us a bit more about these expeditions? Yes, absolutely. So take a look at that video and what you can see is My name is Stockton, Stockton Rush. Rush. I'm the CEO and founder of OceanGate. Let's take a look at Titan. Yeah, so you can see Stockton Rush there. He's giving a tour of Titan, and that's the sub that we believe is missing. It's a carbon fiber and titanium tube, and it was at the Marine Institute base in Holyrood in April, according to a tweet and video from the company. We don't have any official word about who was on board, how many people were on board, but according to the company's website, it can carry up to five people, one pilot, four crew, and it can dive up to 4,000 meters underwater. The company's website, this is important too, also says that it can carry up to 96 hours so that's four days worth of life support on board and it even has a toilet so the titanic wreckage as many people know off the coast of this province by about 380 nautical miles under about 3800 meters uh, of water now they ocean gate they do take tourists to see the titanic but it costs a pretty penny at about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per person and they use that money to uh fund their research into the decaying cruise liner. And I spoke with Larry Daly earlier today. He is a Titanic expert and he dove to the wreck of the Titanic about 20 years ago, actually almost 20 years to this day. Uh, he said it took four hours to reach the ocean floor when he did the dive back in 2003 because it's 2.5 miles underwater. And he did uh, a tour on a different sub but said there were a lot of safety protocols in place when he did that tour and he is remaining optimistic for those who are aboard the sub. I felt very safe. I still think it's very safe. Submersible diving is very safe. Um, you know, the, the, the thrust of the Mariana Trench and I work with uh, 
uh, Don Walsh, one of the gentlemen that was in that, it was a dual, uh, you know, uh, uh, team dove uh, for the Navy back in over 50 years ago, and they dove the Mariana Trench, which again, it's 30 some odd thousand feet down, and did that with old technology. So like I said, you know, uh, we just keep positive, and uh, you know, hopefully the next few hours we get some good news. Now, Daly also said, Daly also says he knows people who are involved in the expedition, not necessarily on the sub, but people who may be uh, offshore on the ship. Now, it's also worthy to note that the U.S. Coast Guard, as we speak right now, is doing a news conference, uh, hopefully with an update and more information on this situation, which we should have for you a little later in the show. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Heather Gillis in St. John's. Well, Canadian Colin Taylor and his son took the tour last summer. He spoke with the CBC earlier this afternoon and had this to say. It's obviously incredibly troubling and, and worrying. Um, it, it is not for the faint-hearted to do something like this, to get in that sub. It's, it's very close quarters. You're in it for a long time. You're bolted in from the outside. There's no way out. There's no hatch to get out of it. Um, so you are you are in that until someone gets you out of the water and unbolts uh, you know, unbolts you from that sub. It, it, what it is is it's a carbon fiber tube, um, very 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 thick carbon fiber tube with two titanium domes on either end. One of them has a porthole, uh, and those titanium domes are opened to allow you to get in, and then they're bolted shut from the outside. So once you're in, you're in. We're not done with this story yet. In about 20 minutes, you'll hear more from Colin Taylor about what it's like aboard the submersible. And as Heather mentioned, the search and rescue effort for the missing sub is being led out of Boston. So we'll bring you that latest from there. That's ahead on Here and Now. In other news, two people were killed in a head-on collision yesterday on Veterans Memorial Highway near Bay Roberts. It happened shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning when a car and a minivan collided. Witnesses say the car traveled over the center line before crashing into the van head-on. A 29-year-old man driving the car died at the scene while the 45-year-old male driver of the van was taken to hospital where he later died of his injuries. There was another occupant inside that van then they were taken to Carbonair Hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Police are still investigating. And that's not all. An SUV crashed through a Tim Hortons in Whitburn last evening. The vehicle left the Trans-Canada Highway and went through the front of the store. Photos on social media show the vehicle against the counter inside the Tim Hortons. The RCMP says one person inside the store was hurt in the crash and that the elderly driver accidentally pressed the gas pedal instead of the brake. The drive through was back open today and repair work was ongoing inside the store. Well, it's been a week since a man was shot and killed in St. John's, but friends of Omar Mohammed say they're still trying to piece together what happened. Police watchdog CERT is investigating the officer involved shooting. Little has been disclosed, including the man's identity. As here in Niles, Ariana Kelland reports, the silence from officials has left many in the community concerned. Akwe Omad is still struggling to process what happened to his friend Omar Mohammed. He's unsure what happened with police and why. All he knows is that his friend is dead. Omar is a very quiet guy. Like he's very kind, he's very quiet and kindness man. Like he's a half heart. Like he believes in other human beings, you know. He believes in people, man. Like Omat saw his friend three days before he died, says he was dressed in a suit and seemed happy, but desperate for a good place to live. He had been, Omat said, for months. His, his life is very sad. For his, he, he don't have no home to stay. Like he's, he's telling me he's, he got tired for that. He go looking for a place all the time. He need like a big kind of help and nobody like help him. Omad understands the feeling. He's homeless too and searching for a stable place to live. He's been living with a friend now for months. Mohammed, he says, spoke little English, which led to a lot of miscommunication, as well as a deep mistrust and fear of police stemming from his life in Sudan. 
that's the problem he tell me like uh, I'm not talking with cops here and I don't want to talk to his cops. I don't need help from cops, no. When he died, Mohammed was wanted by police for breaching court orders, has a criminal record for sexual assault and assaulting a police officer. But Omont didn't know his friend to be violent, just sick and in need of mental health support. They should be know this man is very sick in his head, like, and they should they leave him alone, you know, like if you have a not good day or something like that, they should they can they let him go, you know. For now, it's all speculation. Calls for more information have gone unanswered. And Black Lives Matter NL and the Anti-Racism Coalition says that's part of the problem. Meanwhile, Omot is left to piece together his friend's last days and the systems he says failed him. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the fog has returned again today. This is a live shot of the uh, rooms cam there. And temperatures, you know, another cool day out there. Six degrees. We should be sitting around 17 in St. John's uh, for this time of year. We are very far from that at the moment. Those easterly winds, that's exactly why we're seeing that dense fog out there. And we'll continue to see that as we head through to the night tonight. Lots of showers making their way uh, across the island. A big ridge of high pressure across last Labrador, that is keeping things nice for those of you across the big land, even seeing uh, some warm temperatures into the green here. That's uh, indicative of some of those warmer temperatures and you can see them here. 20 degrees Churchill Falls today. That was the hot spot across the province. 18 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and 17 in Cartwright now or in uh, Lab City rather. There is a lot more where that came from as we head through the next couple of days. Lots of heat, even some humidity moving in up across the big land. But watch what happens Wednesday. Spring officially arrives. We start to see some of that heat across the island as well and maybe even that elusive 20 degree mark uh, for the metro area as we head through the day on Thursday and this will continue into the middle of next week. We'll get into all the details when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Well, there's growing frustration in Marystown over the fate of the town's former shipyard. A plan to transform the facility into a service and supply center for the aquaculture industry has hit some serious headwinds. But as Terry Roberts reports, the owner says they haven't given up hope. Four years ago, Marystown leaders were singing the praises of the new owners of the town's dormant shipyard. These are serious investors. They'll, I think they'll build a big footprint and will employ people and they'll you know, make money, they'll feed their children. We're very excited today. It's very a new beginning. The tone is much different today. We are a hurting environment here now. You know, the economy is bad and we can't, we can't rely on broken promises no more. A company called Marbase Marystown paid $1 million for the shipyard, promising to create hundreds of jobs through the development of a supply hub for the salmon industry. Marbase also planned to grow lumpfish. It would be the first hatchery of its kind in Canada, a natural solution to the problem of sea lice in salmon cages. But the world has changed since these scenes generated so much hype on the Buren Peninsula. A pandemic, serious supply chain upheaval, and rapidly increasing prices as inflation soars. And the aquaculture industry that Marbase was hoping to supply has suffered its share of setbacks, not growing at the pace that most expected. So instead of the busy hub that many had hoped, Marbase is mostly quiet. A storage warehouse for salmon feed, but not much else. It's coming together, but it's just not coming together as fast as we would have liked. The man in charge of Marbase says the original plan is no longer economical. So they're looking at ways to reduce cost. And they've expanded their vision. Plans for a wolffish hatchery as well. And a new partner, Mialpakak First Nation. Marbase is part of my life every day of the week. Every day of the week. I mean, um, I'm in constant contact with our people that are working on the site. Constant contact with our partners in Norway. Constant contact with our, our partners now in uh, Con River. One thing Paul Antle won't do, however, is give a timeline. We are active in, in trying to get everything to a point where, you know, we can pull the trigger. And until we get everything in line, I mean, it's just going to take more time. 
The mayor is not satisfied. We want this to happen, but it's time for them guys to step up and tell us when and what and how you're going to do things and give us times and dates, not promises. Times and dates are no good. We need, we need facts, not promises. This used to be the reality here, a busy shipyard, hundreds of skilled employees. Now it's a waiting game, hoping the aquaculture industry will flourish so the services envisioned for this site will be in big demand. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Marystown. Well, St. John's International Airport isn't so international these days with no transatlantic commercial routes currently operating and only one cross border seasonal flight. Now, the airport authority says it's trying to change that, but it'll take cooperation and government funding. Here and now's Daryl Roberts has more. The last transatlantic flight from St. John's to London, UK, departed in 2019, and it hasn't returned. The route was grounded due to problems with the Boeing 737 MAX, but the CEO of the St. John's International Airport Authority says the pandemic, which all but halted air travel around the world, has made it much more difficult to bring that flight and others back. We have been working on getting international flights back to the airport as soon, as, uh, soon after the ones that we did have uh, concluded, so that's been ongoing through for many years now, including through the, the years of the pandemic. Uh, now we're in a position where, um, you know, those are, are becoming a bit more detailed in terms of the types of negotiations that we're having. Dennis Hogan was speaking at a St. John's Board of Trade event focused on the issue of air access. Board of Trade CEO Anne-Marie Boudreau says it's one businesses in this province struggle with. We live on an island on the eastern edge of Canada, and if you are going to run your business, grow your business, uh, collaborate with others outside of the province, being able to come and go from Newfoundland and Labrador is critical for business success. Before I took over this role... Hogan wants the provincial government to offer a revenue guarantee, meaning a safer investment for an airline, but a potential risk for the provincial government. Given uh, the, the changes that are taking place in the airline uh, sector globally, um, revenue guarantees have become part of the uh, potential package that's reviewed when airlines make decisions on where they are going to establish uh, different routes. Earlier this year, the government of Saskatchewan announced it would provide a revenue guarantee for a WestJet flight between Saskatoon and a U.S. destination. That was worth up to $2.2 million over three years. Tourism Minister Steve Crocker says a revenue guarantee may be an option here too, though there's no agreement in place yet. Any proposal that would come to us, we would certainly evaluate it. That is a new model that, that was referenced today. That is not something that we've, I don't think we've used that model before, but it's a pretty, you know, it brings a pretty strong model because obviously, you know, it's betting on the success, or not betting is the right word, but it's, you know, it's investing on the success of a route. So if you believe in your route when you go to negotiate or have a conversation with an airline, you know, you can say, you know, we, we would look at a revenue guarantee because we're confident that this route would work. Hogan says for now, the airport will continue discussions about bringing transatlantic flights back to St. John's. But for now, no concrete plans are taking off. Daryl Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, after decades of growing the business, the owner of Contemporary Florist in St. John's is packing up shop and hanging up her shears. As you're about to hear, the owner is looking to pass on the legacy. My name is Gail French. I'm the business owner of Contemporary Florist. I have been for 35 years. We do a lot of um, design work mostly. We do weddings, we do funerals, we do um, everything in between, all occasions. Uh, there's always an occasion and uh, there's always flowers for an occasion. Challenges would be, I guess we live on an island. There's always a challenge of trying to get things shipped in, especially with our weather. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things is getting, trying to get what you want uh, when you want it. Uh, so you have to plan, plan a lot for that type of thing. We have done all kinds of different things over the years. We've done, um, you know, some large weddings, uh, decorating for the large weddings. Um, we've done, uh, one of the, the one that stands out, I guess, is Flowers for the Queen, which was very interesting. Um, so that was one of our biggest ones, I guess, doing the Flowers for the Queen. I know it was reds and whites. I know it was, I think there was red roses in it with white flowers. 
um, and they were just centerpieces for all the tables that were there. Very high security, it was very interesting. We'd bring it down and every single arrangement had to be sniffed by dogs, by security. Um, everything, we had, we had to be followed in by security and escorted along the way, so yeah, it was interesting. And who's it being delivered to? And what would you like to say on the card, on the message? I studied in uh, University of Guelph and I, uh, I learned more on design work and floristry is really, um, it's an art form. It's instead of using the paint, you're using flowers. So it's just a different medium to what you. So it's really all about styles and different styles. Worked at it for 35 years. I'm looking for a change. I just, I have a, a wonderful clientele. I've had a clientele that's a loyal clientele for years. Um, I'd like to have somebody take over the business and then I'll step down. Um, but I just, I think it's just time to make some different changes for myself now. Think about things I'd like to do and that I haven't had a chance to do. When you own your own business, it's busy, busy, busy. So right now it's, I think, it, it's time for me just to do something different. So I'm looking for that perfect person, that creative person that can look after my clientele. Well, another wet, gray day for uh, pretty much all across the island portion anyway. Lots of sunshine up across Labrador. That will change, I promise. The sun will come out. I'll get into the details when I come back.
a walk through downtown St. John's and you'll see plenty of new buildings and new businesses, but there's something else you might notice for rent or for lease signs seem to be everywhere. Data from a real estate firm shows the vacancy rate downtown is distressingly high. The CBC's Mike Moore explains. <music> So what's up with vacancies downtown? Just how many retail spaces and office buildings are sitting empty? So the thing is, there's really two kinds of vacancy. Regular vacancy and zombie vacancies. I'll come back to the zombies. Let's start with regular vacancies. In December, downtown St. John's had an office vacancy rate of nearly 37%. That means one in every three desks down here is gathering dust. And that's double the vacancy rate in downtown Halifax, where it's just over 18%. You can really feel it in places like Atlantic Place. The food court here used to be packed with restaurants and packed with people, but now it sits mostly empty and restaurant stalls sit vacant too. What's driving the vacancy rate? In part, it's a long-term trend. Big oil companies like Suncor and ExxonMobil both moved out of downtown in 2020, moving hundreds of workers to cheaper office space elsewhere in the city. Then there's that other thing that happened in 2020. The pandemic drove office workers to work from home, and some haven't come back. Now the office vacancy rate affects more than just offices. The morning coffees and the lunches that office workers buy help support an entire ecosystem of businesses downtown. And if they stay empty, they may turn into the other kind of vacant. A zombie vacancy is a building that's been vacant for so long it's basically dead. Or rather, it's dead on the inside, but the outside part staggers on, slowly rotting and haunting the streets. In other words, a zombie. There are two big zombies in downtown St. John's, the old CBC radio building, and the old Breakwater Books building and former site of Robotham, Mackay and Marshall, which burned down in 2010. These buildings are so vacant, they don't even count in the official vacancy rate, but they definitely count in how we experience downtown St. John's. The Breakwater Book site sits right next to the National War Memorial, and next year the memorial turns 100. This spray-painted construction fence isn't a great backdrop for the celebrations. What can the city do about it? Well, I asked the mayor, he says a vacancy tax isn't on the table, and that the owners of the zombie buildings don't want their buildings to be zombies. Instead, it's economic and market forces that are keeping us from bringing these buildings back to life. There are plenty of bright spots in the downtown picture. Some formerly vacant sites have been restored and some new buildings are going up. But getting that 37% vacancy rate down is a high priority. Very interesting. It was very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so gonna get into the weather, everyone's favorite topic uh, these <laughs> days. You mentioned earlier that uh, there is a chance of some sun, maybe. There well. is. It's uh, finally I can you know say that we do have 20 degrees in the future, which is nice. Lovely. I haven't been able to say that, no, obviously, yeah. in a very long time. In fact, the latest that we've seen the 20 degree temperature was June 22nd, so we should be well above that, uh, hopefully. But right now we are sitting at 10 degrees in St. John's. At least that was daytime high. So you can see those uh, that warmth through Ontario uh, into Manitoba as well. But if I zoom in, some of that warmth is making its way towards Labrador and will continue to do so over the next couple of days. So 17 in Lab City hotspot was in Churchill Falls at 20 degrees today, but lots of single digits across the island. Uh, you had to get to the southwest coast in order to see some of those double digits for the most part. 12 degrees in Wreckhouse, 13 in Stephenville. Uh, we did reach a double digits in St. John's just barely at 10 degrees today, but spring or summer <laughs> it may feel like spring, but summer officially arrives on Wednesday at 1227 Newfoundland time and uh, we will see a sunrise at five o'clock in the morning 503 and sunset the longest day of the year at 902 p.m. and the good news it looks sunny we're finally going to see a change in the pattern we've been seeing these onshore winds for what feels like months 
actually it has been months we've been seeing these onshore flow but as we head through the next couple of days certainly in time for summer so june 21st we will see a change in that pattern more of a westerly flow and that typically brings warmer air and that will continue right through the weekend for the most part and even into next week so we'll continue to see some of those warmer temperatures this takes us in uh, to the weekend so as far as what's happening right now, we're still going to hang on to this drizzle and fog and shower activity through the overnight tonight. And that's because an area of low pressure is bringing all of that moisture. You can see some of those heavier bands of showers moving across the Avalon as we speak, working its way towards central Newfoundland and uh, even some showers up around Green Bay, White Bay at the moment. So expect that to generally continue as we head through to the night tonight. Temperatures are generally in the single digits still. And up across Labrador, you know, you're 17 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. But as we head through to the night, through the night tonight, those temperatures are going to drop. Clear, calm conditions often lead to the potential for some uh, patchy frost. And that is the story as we head through the night tonight between two and six degrees. But again, in low lying areas, you may see some of that patchy frost. Now across the island, it's going to be gray, uh, chance of drizzle and fog. Uh, temperatures will be into the single digits, but there's no chance of uh, drizzle or sorry, no chance of frost tonight. But into Tuesday night, it does look like some of the coolest temperatures we've seen in a while. We'll move in. Here's a look at the future tracker for tonight. All those showers working their way north and then back in again as we head into tomorrow morning, which is why we're going to see that rain drizzle and fog continue along the northeast coast, really through the Avalon. But know what happens for the northern peninsula and then eventually the west coast and then through central we see a clearing trend. So the sun will peak out as the afternoon rolls through. We're going to hang on to the cloudy periods though into Wednesday morning for the Avalon but then we should see some sun. So get through tomorrow, only seven degrees, northerly winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. But by the time we get into Wednesday, double digits will return as will the sun. And then as we head towards uh, Clarenville, Bonavista, double digits, just barely 10 degrees, 15 in Marystown. Like I said, you will see those clearing trends. Same thing through central, uh, about 15 degrees in Grand Falls, Windsor, 11 in Gander. But as you head towards the west coast, those temperatures will be a tad warmer. So around upper uh, upper teens through the day winds out of the northeast around 15 kilometers per hour may see some uh, near 20 but overall a pretty nice day same thing for southeastern portions of labrador northern peninsula 15 uh, degrees or sorry where <laughs> i don't even see 15 portage walk 12 in saint anthony and then up across labrador take a look at that 27 degrees in happy valley goose bay like i said even some humidity it's going to feel or you're going to feel some humidity i should say and we'll talk about the long range forecast when i come back resources from the u.s and canada are being deployed in the search we'll have more on the missing titanic bound submersible from search crews in Boston. We'll also hear from someone who was aboard one of those deep dives just last year.
Returning now to our top story, searching for the Titan, the missing submersible bound for the Titanic wreck. Now that sub went missing roughly 370 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland. It falls under Boston Coast Guard's jurisdiction, and this is what crews there have to say this hour about the search now and the plans going forward. The location of the search is approximately 900 miles uh, east of Cape Cod. Uh, in a water depth of uh, roughly 13,000 feet. It is a uh, remote area uh, and it is uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. Going into uh, this evening, we will continue to uh, fly aircraft and move additional uh, vessels into uh, the area. Uh, in this remote part of our uh, search and rescue responsibility, oftentimes we rely on commercial operators to be the first vessels uh, on scene. And so we've been in touch with additional commercial vessels that are operating in the area as well as uh, initiating uh, the movement of additional Canadian Coast Guard assets uh, and U.S. Coast Guard uh, surface asset uh, into the area over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, adding to the complexity of this case is uh, the fact that uh, this was a uh, submersible vessel. And so we need to make sure that we're looking both on the surface uh, for uh, the vessel if it had uh, uh, surfaced uh, back uh, to uh, the water, uh, but it somehow uh, lost uh, communications with the vessel, and that's what the aircraft and the surface search vessel is allowing us to do right now. But we're also having to uh, search in the water column, and we're doing that right now uh, with the use of uh, sonar buoys and sonar on uh, the uh, ship that's out there to listen for uh, any sounds that uh, we can uh, detect in the water column. Over the course of the next couple of days, uh, we anticipate adding additional capability uh, to conduct um, additional uh, search in the water as uh, those uh, commercial assets uh, arrive on scene. And that was an update uh, from the U.S. Coast Guard just moments ago in Boston. And staying with the story, Colin Taylor and his son are among the few people who know what it's like to be a passenger on the Titan. Taylor shared his thoughts and experiences with CBC earlier this afternoon. There are five of you that go in the submersible. There's the pilot. Uh, there, there's a Titanic expert. Uh, we went with a, a Frenchman named Ph. Narjolet, who is probably, uh, you know, the world expert on, on the Titanic. He's been to the wreck. I'm sure it's now more, but as of last summer, he'd been down 37 times and knew the wreck inside out. Uh, so you spend, it, it's very deep, obviously. It's two and a half miles down, almost 4K, uh, you know, down. So you really feel the weight of the ocean, both... Uh, literally and figuratively, I suppose, uh, as you go down, it takes two and a half hours to go down. Uh, so two and a half hours down, and the, and the the descent is remarkable as well. As you um, as you as you go down, you you lose GPS. So there's no GPS below. You know, actually not very deep at all. You lose ability to access GPS. You have very very primitive communications below a certain depth as well. It's almost sonar-like, and 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 the and the communication is via text, and it's a shorthand text that that we use uh, to communicate with the ship above. And they try and help you guide yourself down because you're untethered, and you're somewhat, uh, you, you know, at, at the whim of the currents, the undersea currents, which go all the way to the bottom, and they go in different directions depending on the depth you're at. So you're moving around. Now the first group didn't didn't get to the Titanic. The second group found one of the boilers but couldn't locate the Titanic. We got very lucky and our pilot, there are only two pilots with Ocean Gate. And the pilot we had um, had been studying the currents all week, particularly, you know, on top of the ocean. And I think was very skillful. And when we hit the bottom, you can then turn on your sonar and you have visibility only about 50 to 100 meters. Uh, but when we turned our sonar on, there was the bow of the Titanic. I mean, literally right there. And it was, 
incredible. Oh, you, you spend all, you know, all week really um, being trained in it. You work on the submersible most of the week with the engineers and technicians that are supporting it. And then they have a very large team that has a very detailed uh, set of protocols and checklists that, you know, and risk assessment all the way through all during the week. It's very, very detailed. They, they're, they're very, they're very, very risk conscious and risk averse. And they spend a lot of time thinking through all the possibilities and, you know, issues that can arise. These are, I, I think they're very capable in that regard. You're two and a half miles down and you are bolted in. And so I, you know, I, my thoughts are, are there. And, you know, I, I, I can't tell you, you know, the fear I have for these people. I really, I, I hope they are okay. Now, what I do know is, and this is from my own experience at the time, is that they have about 96 hours of air. And so they went down, uh, my understanding is they went down yesterday morning. They would have gone very early in the morning, probably four or five in the morning. Um, and I understand they lost contact later in the day. I don't, I don't know exactly when, but they lost contact. Um, so whatever rescue can be mounted now, they will have about three days to find that submersible, free it if it's caught on the wreck and try and get it to surface. Now, even if it's lost power, there are ways that the pilot can drop weights and get it up to the surface. So I think, um, you know, provided it isn't caught on something, they should be able to surface it. Not like going in one of these tourist submarines that, I see people refer to it as as tourists, and uh, you know a lot of people will be familiar with the you know the tourist submarines that you find in the Caribbean and elsewhere. It is nothing like that. You know, it's like going to space on one of these space expeditions, and they treat it like that. Um, you know, with all the support teams and risk assessments and checklists and everything else that are that are wrapped around that. So they. Um, they do spend a lot of time on training, on safety training. Uh, they have a, a very, very capable crew, uh, but it's not without risk. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that they figure a way out of this. A cornhole history was made over the weekend. <laughs> There are two new Canadian champions, and they're both from this province. Coming up, we'll hear about their big win.
Well, it's a game that's popular at backyard barbecues and family events, but there are some serious cornhole players in the province, and you're looking at two of them right now. This is Dion Cusa and Amanda Oakley. They're both fresh off a major tournament that brought about 100 players from across the country and the U.S. to St. John's over the weekend. Now, Dion Cusa is a professional cornhole player and the first Newfoundlander and Labradorian and Canadian to win the new uh, American Cornhole League Canada Open Championship and Amanda Oakley also made history as the first woman from this province and Canada to hold the Canada Open crown. So Dion, for people who don't know much about cornhole, can you uh, describe why this tournament over the weekend was such a big deal? Yeah, uh, the reason it's such a big deal, it's the, uh, this is the third Canadian now Open that's happened in Canada. And, uh, you know, usually it's, it's won by the Americans and uh, myself and Amanda now are the uh, first Canadians to actually win the, the, the tier one singles event. So it was, um, it was a big achievement actually. So, uh, you know, we've kind of made history with that one and uh, I'm sure next, uh, next year there'll be a lot of people out, and, out to get us. So it was a, and a great time. I mean, the people that came from away, that they, they had a tremendous experience and, uh, Got a lot of feedback from them this morning, and other than the weather, didn't cooperate, but um, you know, all in all, it was a great time by everyone. And you made some really great shots uh, at that competition over the weekend. What was it like for you to actually win the whole thing? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I faced the, you know, one of the uh, truly great friend in Bernie Porlesi at, at uh, St. Catharines, um, in the Niagara Falls area, a true gentleman to, to, to be there with in the final, I, I must say. And we gave it everything that we had, and uh, I think we gave people a taste of what professional cornhole playing was like and the pressure that you're under, the intense moments, the decision-making shots, and uh, I got lucky twice. That's probably the, the, the best way to describe it. And Amanda, uh, let's uh, chat with you now. What uh, was the weekend like for you? It's a pretty big deal, uh, making history as well as the first woman to uh, win for your division, uh, first woman from Canada. What was it like for you? Um, it was unreal. I had no expectations to win. I was happy to go out, play my best and win one game. And then as I started winning and winning and, and I ended up on the live stream more and more, I was like, this is getting way above what I had signed up for. Um, and then at the end, it was, I think what gave me that little bit at the end was to hear so many people around, the amount of people there cheering for you and knowing that, you know, you were there not only to support the Cornhole friends, but like Newfoundland, it was an amazing feeling. Um, don't know if I'd ever want to be in that situation again. <laughs> a bit of pressure, right? A bit right? of pressure, yeah. No, but at the time it was amazing and I can't thank everybody enough who was there. What was it like to have all of these people, about 100 people from all over Canada and the U.S., come to St. John's for this kind of tournament? Um, it was great. Uh, you know, everybody had been saying how they couldn't wait to come and just to meet them and be open and friendly. Um, one of my last games yesterday, actually, uh, was against a girl from away, and we had, I think we spent more time chatting. It was so great to meet all these people. Um, never really thought I'd go anywhere traveling for cornhole, but if there's ever an opportunity to go and stay with these people up there and play with them, I'd go in a heartbeat. They were all excellent to be with. What is the appeal of this game? Um, I guess to me, I've played sports all growing up, um, but since I started cornhole, the family that we have at Cornhole NL is different than any sport I've ever played. Normally you have your own teammates, um, but with this, it's everybody. It's a group event. You might be in a game where you're playing the most serious person there, but at the end of it, it's still high fives, good game, just the atmosphere at it. Some days I don't even know if I want to play cornhole. I just want to go for the socialization part of it. <laughs> and Dion, I'm wondering, what do you think is the future of this game? Because it only seems like it's been growing and growing and growing over the years. Where do you see cornhole going uh, as a professional game? Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's crazy, actually. It's already now starting to hit international. I mean, uh, I've actually traveled to uh, the Netherlands and, and competed uh, and traveled with the guy who I actually just uh, beat in the final. And uh, But, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're taking this so international now that, you know, with the hopes of this probably be playing at the Olympics and stuff. And, you know, none of this would be impossible, would be possible without Cornhole NL, uh, you know, starting off this league, joining the ACL. And Sean Amber, who joined us here today, as I mentioned, they've won twice now, they've won the International Director of the Year, which goes to show 
the effort that these guys put in and without him, none, none of this would be possible really. Well, Dion Cruza and Man Oakley, congratulations on your big win over the weekend. Looking forward to see what uh, happens next. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so before we get the, to the long range forecast, uh, time to reveal the winner of our January contest. It's Marilyn Green. Yes, a belated birthday present for Marilyn. She's usually walking around Trinity this time of year in shorts, but it's raincoats and drizzle lately. Yeah, so congratulations, Marilyn, and uh, thanks to everyone for sending in your pictures, your January photos. Uh, we're all in this together, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> Mar right. Marilyn will be in touch uh, with how best to get you your prize. We certainly will. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the forecast because there are some good things on the way, right? There's some shorts in people's future, <laughs> I think, <laughs> over good. the next couple of days. Let's just take a look. We'll jump right into summer. Uh, pretty much feet first, it looks like, at this head first. I don't know what the saying is, but anyway, 17 degrees uh, will be the daytime high in St. John's on Wednesday, the first official day of summer. And look at that, a whole lot of sunshine icons out there. 
temperatures through central west coast into the uh, low 20s, so 23 or 24 degrees, and then up across Labrador, you're generally looking at uh, the chance of some showers, albeit light showers, but they're still there. Uh, you should reach 29 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay, 27 in Lab City, and again, it will feel a tad humid as well. Still going to hang on to that 10 degree mark, though, up across Nain with some periods of rain through the afternoon. And uh, yeah, a, a really lovely Wednesday. And as we head into Thursday, I have that 20 degree mark there. I hope it happens, but at this point it does look favorable. Uh, maybe even a degree or two warmer in some cases, uh, but certainly as we head towards central 25, 26 degrees, same thing for the West Coast. Along the South Coast, you're in onshore flow, which will keep temperatures a tad cooler, but still quite comfortable. 21 in Marystown, Port of Ash should hover around the 18 degree mark. Cooler for the Northern Peninsula and up across Labrador, you're still hanging on to that 20 degree mark in um, Happy Valley Goose Bay 27 in Lab City, but towards the coast temperatures are going to dip just a little bit. So 10 to 12 degrees as your daytime highs. Long range forecast looks nice. Nice as this has been in months. 19 degrees for your Friday. Saturday at this point looks lovely too at 22 degrees. So let's hope that sticks. <laughs> now for central Newfoundland, you're looking at a, a pretty big warm up by Friday, 29 degrees, 28 on Saturday. However, it looks a bit a tad rainy for you. Then for western Newfoundland, 24 to 26 degrees. So a nice stretch of weather. And then for eastern Labrador, some showers on Friday. That'll cool things down a little bit. They'll hang around for the First half of Saturday, then some sunshine, 23 degrees. And then for Western uh, Labrador, you're looking at a similar forecast for your Saturday. Showers in the morning and then clearing as the day goes on and 20 degrees. This is a cool photo, literally uh, an iceberg in Trouty Gordon shared this great shot with us. And if you have any wonderful weather photos to share with us, send them to Facebook, Twitter, or email them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, wow, that's a great shot. And it's great the perspective you get with the, the boat there in front of it to yeah. really get a sense of how big it is. It's a big one. Yeah, <laughs> my goodness. Thank you so much for that. Well, that's it for us on this Monday evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night.